thank you very much for uh, joining us on this panel. Much appreciated. Um, so, e-commerce e experience and the customer experience kind of going forward. We're we'll talking about a lot about that today. Um, for me, it's interesting because we have three different brands here that provide different perspectives. We have so Shoe, or an omni-channel kind of UK-based retailer, strong physical and online presence. We have Clarins, who are a kind of concessions-based business when it comes to physical retail, but have a global e-commerce presence. And we have Lidl, of course, who have no transactional commerce capabilities, but still a strong digital footprint. So to get things going, it'd be good to get your opinion and your, and your approach to innovating the e-commerce experience or um, the ways in which you look to improve the e-commerce experience for your customers and your, your general approach to that. So Sean, we start with you on that matter. Well, I suppose what we do, Alex, is we, <clears throat> we think very carefully about our customer journey and how we organize ourselves around sort of moments that matter or key moments in that journey. And where, if, if it still exists, where the lowest hanging fruit is or where the pinch points for the consumer are most obvious. And we prioritize work around getting that journey right. And fundamentally it is get a customer down a, a funnel of sorts so that they want to buy something at the end. So, it, it's about identifying pinch points, but knowing your journey extremely well. And where's that low-hanging fruit at the moment, do you think? Well, for us, uh, there's a number of pinch points. Um, the, look, our business is, is very much about availability and availability in the moment. And the market has become increasingly itemized. So it's actually about things like location of stock, clarity of availability messaging, um, use of things like scarcity to help people get over the line in faster times, uh, you know, and making sure we sell things at the best terminal price as quickly as possible across channels that share the inventory. So we, we, we sell everything out of a single inventory. And, and Sebastian, you're a you know, Clarence Group, big label brand, yep. global e-commerce offering. Kind of what's your approach and how do you kind of scale that offering um, at Clarence? Well, the, the main challenge, in fact, is being a global group and being a global brand operating in the, in the world because we, we operate uh, 35 sites now for 30 countries at least and with a few, few limited resources, uh, but 10 to, to 15 people working on, on e-commerce purely uh, at the IT group. Um, and we have uh, as many configurations as West countries, basically. Uh, because even if we want to, to provide the same customer experience to um, all our consumers, independently of being in China or being in, uh, in the US or in the UK, um, it's very specific and local at the end. Uh, which means we really have to provide this experience which has been thinking, uh, uh, has been thought uh, at the corporate level, and then deliver it locally. Uh, which is a challenge because content is local and you have not the main, main con uh, same content if you are uh, reading from left to right and right to left, basically. Yeah. Um, not the same thing in terms of logistics, not the same thing in terms of uh, even uh, alphabet, so <laughs> it's, it's, it's quite complicated, but uh, the main thing is being sure that we, we stick to this uh, uh, customer experience and uh, make uh, uh, smart move and small move uh, locally to, to being able to, to address our consumer locally. And Alex, no transactional capabilities on the little site, but what's your kind of take on innovating the digital experience at Lidl? Because you have a big digital footprint. So uh, I think Sean's absolutely right that uh, thinking about customer pain points and looking at how the kind of digital innovation can address those. Obviously, in a, in a store environment, there are ways you know, to, to address that as well. The other way that we very much look at it as a business is that um, it's not just about consumers, actually looking inwards at your own business and looking at how digital innovation um, as a retailer can be delivered from inside the business, both to renew your way of thinking. So if, as a business, we have a highly optimized um, set of processes. Um, and uh, although those processes operate really well, as consumer behavior changes and as customer expectations change, we actually need to innovate internally, both in terms of what we offer customers, but also our way of thinking so that we can keep up with those changes. So that's really important for us that, yes, it's customer pain points that we need to look at how we can solve those, but also internally, how do we start to reshape our own thinking as well. And how do you, how do you narrow down those customer pain points how do you kind of um, prioritize those as well in terms of delivering something digitally? So, I mean, I think they, 
it's helpful not to be too speculative. So, um, you know, I'm, I, I'm, all for it. I'm actually all for innovation for innovation's sake because I actually think it does renew one's thinking to think differently and think about new challenges. But ultimately, if you can identify what those customer pain points are and even try anything um, to, to address them. So um, those of you who heard me speak back in, in, in March, uh, would have heard me talk about the, the, the chatbot that we launched. And this was a direct response to the fact that we have customers in store who want to buy wine from us. Uh, they don't know which wine they should choose. We don't have people on the ground in stores with that knowledge. So how are we actually going to help people navigate that category? So providing people with a cost-effective way for the business but an effective way for customers to be able to get help and advice in store in a category that they find confusing, that felt, we felt like, well, that's a, a customer pain point, yeah. and actually there's a business issue here as well in that we can't have people just wandering around um, you know, offering advice. That's not our model, our, you know, our, our very efficient model. So how else can we address that, that pain point? So that was an area where digital innovation actually addresses both a business need and a consumer need at the same time. Yeah. And from a, I mean, you've all mentioned the relationship in the store and online, call that omni-channel, multi-channel, all those buzzwords, but what, I mean, Sebastian, how are you looking to kind of bring digital more into the store? How are you looking to connect those two channels up so they, they work, they tick? Right. Well, that, that, that's a really tricky one, especially when we, you, you speak about our business because we, we work in cosmetics, we work in fragrance. So uh, it's a very physical experience. We, we work in, mm. in spa business as well, so it's physical experience. And bringing digital in store is really, really complicated. Um, how can we provide uh, something different, something unique uh, to our customers? And um, because there, there are already some initiatives with some magic mirrors, to, uh, with some uh, virtual reality to, to let you imagine when, how you can be with this kind of makeup, this kind of uh, cosmetics, and it's quite tricky. Um, wh what we are trying to, to do, in fact, because we are quite new, let's say, in the retail business, we, yeah. we come from the distribution business, uh, is to, to, um, uh, to take advantage of our digital presence to drive people in store. That's, that's really our first, uh, our first step. Uh, it's really to, to, yeah, to, to bring people in store thanks to digital. So it's obviously a drive to store, but it's also shipped from store. Um, to, yeah, to, to, to make people aware that we, we are present in the, in the retail business mm -hmm. and we can provide something. Um, but in fact, the, the main thing we are doing on this, this point is uh, to enhance our beauty advisor's uh, efficiency. Because uh, today at, the, at our group, the less digitalized population is our beauty advisor. Um, the, the, that's why it is because we have a, a legacy business, it's, uh, it's French, it's old-fashioned, etc., etc. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, but um, uh, yeah, they are not really uh, digitalized, so we provide them with some apps, uh, a clienteling, applica clienteling application, to uh, propose the, the, this population, our, our sellers, to um, make their diagnostics uh, quicker and in a more fancy way. So. Uh, they, they are perceived as being uh, more modern nowadays because of this application, and uh, it basically improves their, their knowledge of the customer, the capacity to propose a personal experience, and uh, well, it's, it's some kind of a success. So at the end, the, re the, the answer is proposing something to our consumer, not so easy, but to the, 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 the people in store, um, that has been great at the time. Yeah. And Sean, you, you've been in retail for a long time. Hundreds of years. Hundreds of years, yeah, <laughs> ancient. Uh, but I think the point that both Alex and Sebastian are making is really pertinent in that there is, there's no formula here. You've got to work out what the levers in your business are that you should yeah. pull, you know, yeah. where your customer needs some assistance or where your processes could do with some optimization. And I think that's true of all of us. There isn't a formula. Yeah. It's just where do you think, the, you know, given that, you've probably more things you could do than you have resources to do them. Where do the battles look like you should fight? And yeah. the battles that, you know, in our world are most likely to move the needle, the needle being conversion or a basket size or, or, you know, a sale. Is that one of your, I mean, a question for you, is that one of your biggest challenges, understanding where to kind of place your bets? No. No? No, that, that's relatively easy. Yeah. Because you can, you know, you can, you can do things in contained circumstances. You can test. You can empirically prove the value or other ways of what you're doing. I, I, I don't think that's difficult at all. I think, I, I, th I think the plethora of things that you could do and the speed at which you do them 
is a far greater challenge than identifying what to do. I think what to do is relatively straightforward. And I do get asked, I do get asked, um, is this innovation going to be successful? <laughs> and I say, well, I have no idea. That's why we're doing it. Yeah. You know, yeah. and, and, and genuinely, there are, there are you, you want to have a, hypo a hypothesis that you're approaching innovation with, of course, and you've got to have that problem in mind. But um, I frequently have a conversation to say, you know, it's, if, if, if we eliminate this as being something that we should follow up, and we don't spend, you know, a ridiculous amount of money, you know, trialing it or testing it, then, then, then that's good. Yeah. Because we're one step closer to finding something that does work if we find something, you know, find something that doesn't work. Yeah. Um, and it, it's very easy to say that, but I, I find that with a lot of businesses, it, you know, there's a lot of kind of, yeah, go, go innovate. But the, the, the passion to allow people to go, that definitely didn't work, um, maybe doesn't come with the same sort of force yeah. of... Uh, yeah, yeah you're story. right. And, and yet the, the execution is also key because we, yeah. we have lots of possibility in terms of innovation, but we have small time, so it's a, especially in the retail business, because the, 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 the salesperson have a very limited time to convince, to, to, to make a, um, different, uh, different uh, tasks. And if you ask to try this kind of innovation, another one, another one, it's, it's really complicated, and the process of yeah. sale is very time consuming. So we really have to, to select the innovation we want to test during this period of time, and we want to, to test well. So it's yeah. really complicated, complicated, but it's... Well, and, and sometimes the innovations are just not at the right time. It's not even yeah. that they're a bad idea. No, I mean, I, I literally remember first looking at click and collect lockers about 15 years ago, and there was like zero interest from consumers at all. And it's not that it was, it's not that it was a bad idea, it's just there wasn't enough volume, there wasn't enough interest, there wasn't enough... Yeah you know, kind of awareness, I think, or just demand for it. But, you know, you look at it now, the amount of, you know, click and collect lockers that are pr proliferating, um, you know, it is, now, is now the time for that to kind of hit a scale, um, you know, but it, was, it certainly wasn't there 15 years ago, but it doesn't mean it was a bad idea. And so I am finding a lot of ideas that I came across, you know, in the early 2000s are beginning to, right. to sort of come, come back around through the cycle. It's quite interesting to go through, if, if any of you keep notes for that long, to, you know, go back over your kind of notebooks <laughs> and think like, I oh yeah, sure. that was an interesting idea. Yeah. It totally didn't work then. I wonder if yeah. that's something we can... Yeah, may, may, <laughs> question of use case as well, because the, the, something we tested a couple of years ago with this kind of use case was not the right one. And now I think we're more mature in terms of marketing uh, when we face a technology. We, we are more mature because we, we are more able to, to say, okay, this is a proper use case we want to test and more efficient at the end. So, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think you've got to work out what your appetite for risk is. You know, it's good, yes. to, it's good to take an educated, uh, absolutely educated risk and find room for risk. But you've only got so many lives. If everything you do is a risk and doesn't fly, then your capacity for risk will, by definition, shrink yeah. as the business gets, wide, you know, gets wise to what you're up to. Um, but also, there's very little advantage. As you said, it depends on your scale. There's very little advantage to being first mover in something yeah. if you don't have the capacity to educate the public that what you're doing is useful or interesting. Mm. You know, so I, you know, I think it's interesting to be sort of upper quartile mover, but not in no way a first or second mover, because that's just no, that's not suitable for a business our size. Yeah. And, so, and you're right, and, and I think the appetite for risk is really important. So, yeah. you know, w w w there's a whole, whole world of startups that, you know, that have become, you know, world conquering, not necessarily profitable, but world conquering in terms of their, you know, their output. I mean, you know, Uber, if you think about the size, the scope, the scale of, uh, of Uber, um, you know, they're still working out, I think, you know, what their, their business model should be long term. But what's really important there is that they have created a paradigm change within the market. And even if Uber ends up not working out, who knows, but even if as a business that that actually ends up not being sustainable, what's happened is that they've completely transformed the way that consumers approach that particular medium. So you know, other you know second movers or people coming through will come with slightly tweaked business models, uh, you know, a slightly different offer. But what we'll never do is we'll never go back to how it was before. Yeah. Um, and so you know that that innovation effectively has changed the consumer perception to the degree mm. that actually the old models don't work at all. Um, but you know, the, there is definitely an opportunity for people to come in, maybe a, a bit more niche or the slightly different business model to come in and say, actually, from a kind of business point of view, to make this work, there's an opportunity here. So I think that's something that businesses can certainly think but, about. But Uber is a fascinating case in point, isn't it? Because Uber is about customer journey, removal of L literally. friction. Literally, I mean, the, literally the <laughs> checkout-free purchase of a product. Yeah. You know, so that, that's the ultimate. It's the ultimate friction-free 
mm. product experience, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. True. So in, in terms of, so you mentioned Uber, how, how closely do you follow you know, Uber, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, what these big brands are doing? Because when you think about it, the top, those top five big technology companies, we spend the majority of our time with them. And what they do influences how we behave and how our brains get, get rewired, for example. How, how, how closely do you follow what they do to understand how the consumers can behave? Quite closely. And therefore what you should, yeah. Quite closely, particularly Amazon, I would say, because if you're a retail business, Amazon presents an existential threat. So watching quite carefully what they do in terms of functionality, logistics, the things that you can see are clearly working for them on their site, the things that aren't working, you know, things yeah. like, you know, the fact that they're doing echo with screens tells you something about the challenges of voice search yep. and the very binary uh, set, set of results that you get with something like a voice search. So it's quite educational. So uh, for me, Amazon is head and shoulders above the rest in terms of what they do being important, but they all, they're, they're all worth watching, certainly, yeah. In, in, in terms of voice, I'm glad you mentioned it, Sean. We're at the start of this kind of wave of voice tech, essentially. I think from a consumer adoption standpoint, most people, the majority, probably have an Amazon or a Google device in their homes. They probably ask it very basic things. So, what's yeah. the time? Set my alarm. You know, basic kind of utility. Yeah. F for voice to win, it needs to go the other end of the spectrum, where it's delivering a real brand value. How do you see the free? How do you see voice as an interface playing out over the next, you know, two, three, four, five years in the future? How do you see it become more relevant in our lives? And what steps should brands be taking? I know you're, you're eager. I no, no, no. I think we have to start. We have to start. We have to start with him because he's demonstrably a good soothsayer of the future. So uh, you know, but there's volume there. Yeah. You know, people are consuming the product that allows them to learn about voice in volume. Yeah. People do speak. They do search. Um, they use devices that are all about convenience that are equipped for voice. So it's reasonable to be confident that voice will play a role. Yeah. Um, and we, are, we have a business that's extremely um, itemized in nature. People really do look for an item, and voice might be relevant in that scenario. Yeah. Um, so we'll put a toe in the water and we'll see. We, you know, the answer is we simply don't know, but we feel we should be experimenting and soon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, you know, we, I've got sort of a, a, a older teenage children, and I kind of think like, it's not helpful for me actually quite often to ask that question. It's more helpful to ask that question to people who are 20 years younger than me. Yeah. Because you know, I'm, I'm really conscious that when we, if you think about how we searched, you know, and, on, at the advent of Google, you know, and we went with our kind of key, keyword, and then we went to keyword phrases, and then we kind of went to, uh, you know, kind of mobile, so now we're entering it on a, on a different type of keyboard. So very subtly, the way that we kind of search changes. Yeah. Uh, and I, you know, I was having this conversation, I think j j just, just last night actually, with somebody who was saying, it's like, how many of you in this room go on your, on your phone and make a call like this? Now, if, you, if you're a certain age, that's totally normal. You'll walk down the street with that on speakerphone, having a phone call out loud. That's right. And for some of us a certain age, we look at that like, but that's not private. And that's really annoying. And why are you doing that? But for a whole generation that's coming up um, you know, in their kind of early tw 20s, you know, that's, that's totally normal to have your, your phone call like that. Or like that, you know, have your video call in the street, even more annoying. <laughs> but f I just think with, with interfaces like voice, we'll just find that there's a whole generation of people who use it and respond to it in a way that's completely different to us. And, um, you know, yes, we have to apply ourselves to it, but we damn well better be talking to the, the generation that are growing up effectively mm, yeah. with these interfaces exactly. because they're the ones who are going to shape the use of it far more than we are. Yeah, yeah. yes, that's Honestly. true. Honestly. Yeah, yeah we, we're following as well the, uh, uh, exactly the same concern we have that, that you two guys. And uh, um, the question we have also is because we are in, in, the, in the beauty market, is how can we make emotion uh, in, into, the vo into the voice? Because it will be part of the business for sure. The technology is not still convincing. But it's there, it's growing, it's a growing number of devices at home. And uh, but the question is, uh, when you, the, the, the voice experience we have today is the relationship between uh, a seller and, uh, and a consumer. And uh, it's a diagnostic uh, we made on uh, what are your concerns, what are your type of skin, uh, what 
type of fragrance you wear, and, um, and after the magic happens. I mean, is, a, is a, the capacity of a beauty advisor to, to select something which is suitable for a consumer? And the question we have is, how can we make it in with, uh, with technology? Mm. But we truly con convinced that it will be part for, for, for instance, we, um, the, the head of the Thierry Mugler's brand, uh, Sandrine Grolier, has offered to all our staff uh, an Alexa device, an Echo device, to make them test uh, the possibility of, uh, of the device. Uh, yeah. We we truly believe that it will be part. Don't know how, but uh, we're, we're only at the beginning. But uh, and at the end, if we are not in, maybe maybe out. Especially with Amazon device, because yeah. uh, if we are not there, I mean the the, the, the orders will be <coughs> directly passed to Amazon and without uh, coming to our shop. So very true. Exactly. Yeah. I, I did a uh, presentation at university quite recently, and I asked how many people send voice notes on WhatsApp rather than type. And over half the room put their hand up. And these are like 18 year old, you know, 18, 19 year olds. Um, so I definitely see the research that we do, the younger generation, using voice a lot more to communicate with one another. And as, you, as your point earlier, that leads to kind of consumer adoption and, and it becomes normal for them and they expect that yeah. same engagement with brands. So. But I think we'll also, to, to Sean's point, I suspect what we'll also see is more hi hybrid interactions yeah. over time because you can actually see that you know voice has its limitations yeah. visual has its limitations but having a connected ecosystem whereby those things effectively can talk and say you ask for something but actually you don't want the response or audible you want it visual and so to have that kind of connected ecosystem whereby yeah. actually all of your senses are engaged yeah. and the you know the the interactions are tailored for the best yeah. format in terms of what you get and i suspect yeah. you know it's early days still but you know the connected homes type yeah. environment where we've got multiple devices um you know both both spoken, visual, tactile, even. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And if you had the smell, I mean, absolutely. Yeah. Perfect, yes. <laughs> yeah. But I think when well, it comes to when it comes to websites, I think that combination of voice and visual is probably yeah. where we'll prove the concept. Yeah. Because because at the minute we know, you know, we know how people search using text, in mm. you know on search bars and websites yeah. and how that performs relative to everything else generally better. And what we'll be able to do is measure the difference between a text search and a voice search and what that interaction looks like. You know, so I think there are clear points of comparison that are a place to get started. And all we need to do is prove a concept. Yeah. And, and, it, and it can be a niche, and it can be a niche for half a percent of your customers, but if it's a useful niche, you can invest to some extent in, in that. Okay. We, we, we talked about voice and I mean, innovations and what you guys would like to do. What's, um, in terms of digital skills within retail and with your teams. I think Jonathan from Miss Guardia probably touched upon this earlier. Do you think there's a, 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 kind of a digital skill problem within retail as a whole? And what, what's your kind of take on that? Because I used to work retail week and that was, that was one of the questions that we got a lot from retailers was, you know, we're struggling to find the right digital talent. Yeah. Sean, sure you're not in there, what's your take? Well, it's definitely our experience with finding, you know, I, I agree with the panelists earlier, you know, curiosity, soft skills, they're all very, very important. Numeracy, yeah. ability to spell and communicate properly with people. Uh, and technical skills are findable, but they're findable in a very, very competitive market. Yes. Mm. So the, the access to those skills, the affordability and retention of those skills is quite a challenge. And so our way of doing it, and we're in a more remote geography than some other people is to is to reinforce learning through pay increments and offer you know modular education to people based on benchmark standards that we want to achieve and then give them pay increments when they complete those modules mm -hmm. so we're hopefully trying to say learning is good learning pays and would like you to stay and here's a pathway over time that allows you to earn more and you can see what that looks like and so we're we're trying well, for, for myself what i observed is I don't think we have, we have specific uh, uh, problems silo per silo. I mean, we have good experts in e-commerce, good experts in retail, but having people a bit, um, able to think globally, to think transverse, is very complicated. I mean, mm. the, the purpose today is to propose a 360 experience, 360 view of our customer, three, uh, physical to digital, and, and so on. And uh, uh, people are able to think end-to-end -end customer journey. Uh, that is more difficult to, because it's the, the life of our customers. They switch from digital. They, they start their uh, journey digital and they, f they, they finish uh, uh, physical or opposite. And yeah. it's quite complicated to make the, this silo work together uh, and having a really end-to-end -end, uh, perspective. 
that that's where the the, the key yeah, yeah the key the complexity is for my my understanding and i think to that point i think it needs two things it needs a champion at the top of the business yep. to say this is important and it needs remits to be appointed that allow that view to take place you know if people sit in silos yeah, in sort of legacy remits mm. people only manage out to the edge of their remit or slightly out beyond the edge of their remit so you need you need people with the right jobs yeah. that empower them to think the way you're describing it fully yeah. agree and i think you know uh, conversely to your scenario where you you know obviously you're a bit more remotely located so a little based in in wimbledon in in southwest london um, but we we don't find uh, finding people isn't the tricky thing. Keeping people is tricky. So obviously, in, in a, on the edge of a capital city, um, there's, there's, there's plenty of choice and there's plenty of great people, but there's also uh, a huge amount of opportunities that are always kind of circling and circling. So I think this, this um, need for businesses not only to find great talent, but to find what matters to them and that's that's not really anything new you know uh, uh, as a business finding out what matters to somebody in terms of their their job so giving a real a real sense of purpose to what they do mm -hmm. um, giving people enough autonomy that they feel that they can you know they can own own their own role and yeah. uh, and as you say le you know learning and development's absolutely crucial mm -hmm. um, but there is definitely, I still think, a, a skills gap just generally in terms of volume. When I tried to hire a, a digital project manager the other day and I couldn't find anyone who wanted a, uh, a permanent salary that I could afford. They all wanted to do day rates and they wanted, actually what they wanted was flexibility to be able to come and have that option to, uh, you know, to, to move, move away from the business at, at, at some point. Yeah. You know, and that, that's, that's something we have to engage with as a business if that's the reality that's out there. Yeah. Um, but trying to explain that digital mindset, obviously to a, what might be a very traditional HR department, you know, is, is a part of the education piece mm. as well. Sure. Yeah. And to round off the panel, uh, this year, what do you want to be doing more of? What do you want to be less of? What's um, Alex, start with you. So uh, my main goal is to spend more, t more time up close, face to face with startups, basically, because uh, I just think in j just that fresh thinking, people who are looking to break into kind of niche spaces is just to get that, get my own thinking actually just refreshed and renewed, come out of my own sort of day to day work and just go, just go and meet meet with startups. I, 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 the few times I've done it, I've just found it incredibly invigorating and has renewed my own, my own thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to wrap up, guys. Thank you very much for being on the panel. Much appreciated. And have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Thank you. Thank you.